In the late 70s and early 1980s, Richard Stallman was doing artificial intelligence research and coding at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. Richard had a number of negative experiences during that period which soured him on the whole idea of commercial software. Such as? Um, some code that he wanted to work on and wanted to fix was locked up and he couldn't get the company that owned the code to let him fix it, even though it would have been to their advantage to do so. And that put me into a moral dilemma, you see, because to get one of the modern computers of the day, which was the early 80s, you would have to get a proprietary operating system. The developers of those systems didn't share with other people. Instead, they tried to control the users, dominate the users, restrict them saying, if to get this system, you have to sign a promise you won't share with anybody else. And to me, that was essentially a promise to be a bad person, to betray the rest of the world, cut myself off from society, from the cooperating community. And I had already experienced what happened when other people did that to us, when they refused to share with us because they had signed these contracts. And it hurt the whole lab, kept us from doing useful things before. So. I just wasn't going to do that. I felt this is wrong. I am not going to live this way. And from experiences like this, he developed a profound hostility to the idea of intellectual property and software. He eventually acted this out by founding the Free Software Foundation. So I looked for another alternative, and I realized I was an operating system developer. If I were to develop another operating system, and then, as the author, encourage everyone to share it. Say, everyone, you come and get it, use this, form a new community. Not only could I give myself a way to keep using computers without betraying other people, but I'd give it to everybody else, too. Everybody would have a way out of that moral dilemma. And so I realized this was what I had to do with my life. I actually began the project in January of 1984. That's when I resigned from my job at MIT to start developing the GNU operating system. Now, I should explain that the name GNU is a hack because it's a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's not Unix. You see, so the G in GNU stands for GNU. And what the name means is I was developing a system that was like the Unix operating system, but was not the Unix operating system. This was a different system. We would have to write it completely from scratch because Unix was proprietary. We were forbidden to share Unix. We couldn't use Unix. It was useless for a community. So we had to write a replacement for it. Throughout the 1980s, as Richard Stallman was building the GNU project, computer scientists from the University of California at Berkeley were developing their own free operating system. Known as Berkeley Unix, or BSD, it was based upon the Unix kernel which had been licensed from AT&T. However, due to legal problems with AT&T and fragmentation of the source code, hackers and other non-institutional users were slow to adopt it. Well, Unix consisted of a large number of separate programs that communicated with each other. So we just had to replace these programs one by one. So what I started doing was writing a replacement for one program, and then another, and then another, and then people started joining me because I published an announcement inviting other people to join me to help write these programs. And, uh, and by around 1991, we had replaced practically all of them. What were some of the programs that you Well, we had to, to have a complete system, you need to have a kernel, which is the program that allocates resources to all the other programs. You need a compiler, which translates a program from readable source code that programmers can understand into numbers, mysterious numbers that the computer can actually run. You need other programs that go with the compiler to help do this job. You need a debugger. You need a text editor. You need text formatter. You need mailers. You need lots and lots of things. There are hundreds of programs in a Unix-like operating system. 
I, I saw Stallman's announcement. Actually, I met him in February of 1987. He came to give a five-day tutorial on Emacs at our company. And during the day, he would explain new ways to think about Emacs and ways to extend and enhance it and to use the Emacs source code uh, for better or worse. But in the evening, he was, he was busily working on this compiler, and he had not yet released it to the public, so he was, uh, he was being a little bit uh, uh, careful about who, who got to see the source code. But I was very eager, and when he first announced it in June, I downloaded it immediately. I, I played with it. I got some, some pointers from him. And when I sent the source code back to him, he was, uh, he was very actually amazed at how quickly uh, I was able to ramp up on his technology. Whenever we worked on something at Stanford or in the university, we would get, mostly at the time, we were working off of machines from digital equipment or Sun, mostly Sun. Whenever we would get a Sun machine, the first thing we would do is we would spend literally days downloading GNU free software from the internet, building it and installing it on that Sun machine. The crucial thing about GNU is that it's free software. Now, free software refers not to price, but to freedom. So think of free speech, not free beer. The freedoms that I'm talking about are the freedoms to make changes if you want to, or hire somebody else to make changes for you if you're using the software for your business, to redistribute copies, to share with other people, and to make improvements and publish them so that other people can get the benefit of them too. Now those are the freedoms that distinguish free software from non-free software. These are the freedoms that enable people to form a community. If you don't have all these freedoms, you're being divided and dominated by somebody. My first experience contributing to free software came in late 1989, early 1990. I was working as a graduate student at Stanford University on computer-aided design tools. One of the pieces I needed was a tool called a parser generator. Well, the Free Software Foundation under Richard Stallman had created a great tool called Bison. I needed a tool that worked with C++. Bison worked with C. I modified Bison to create something called Bison++. And it was a tremendous feeling of empowerment to be able to take a piece of software that was available and create what you needed in a very short piece of time by modifying it. I put it back on the internet and I was amazed at the number of people that picked it up and started using it. In fact, I remember going to uh, job interviews. I at various times considered just going out and getting a job and I had gone to a job interview and I was talking with one of the people and I started asking them about what tools they used and they said, gee, we use Bison++. And I said, oh, I'm the author of Bison++. Free software generally does have a copyright, it does have an owner, and it has a license. It is not public domain. If we put the software in the public domain, somebody else would be able to make a little bit of changes and turn that into a proprietary software package, which means that the users would be running our software, but they wouldn't have freedom to cooperate and share. To prevent that, we use a technique called copyleft. The idea of copyleft is that it's copyright flipped over. And what we do is we say, this software is copyrighted, and we, the authors, give you permission to redistribute copies. So we give you permission to change it. We give you permission to add to it. But when you redistribute it, it has to be under these terms, no more and no less, so that whoever gets it from you also gets the freedom to cooperate with other people if he wants to. And then in this way, everywhere the software goes, the freedom goes too. And it becomes an inalienable right to cooperate with other people and form a community. And so what is that, the license, what, what is that going? Well, copyleft being a general idea, in order to use it, you have to have a specific example. And the specific example we use for most GNU software packages is the GNU general public license particular document in legalese which accomplishes this job. A lot of other people use that same license. For example, Linus Torvalds uses that license for Linux as well. Well, the license I use is the GNU general public license. That's the one that Richard Stallman wrote. And I think it's a really astounding contribution. Uh, it's one of the few software licenses that was written from the standpoint of the community rather than from the standpoint of uh, 
protecting a company or uh, as is the case with the MIT and the BSD license, uh, performing the goals of a government grant program. Uh, and the GPL is really unique in that it's not just a license, it's a whole philosophy that I think motivated the open source definition. I don't hide that a lot of what I do came from Stallman. <laughs>